I'd like, like to use some scripture this morning from the 19th chapter of First Kings. If I have a thought that I would want you to think about, uh, it would be this. What dost thou hear? What are you doing here? In this particular portion of the word of the Lord, uh, Elijah has just completed that powerful experience of where that he had called all the people together and had uh, preached uh, and, and prayed the power of God down from out of heaven to demonstrate to the people that there truly is a God of heaven. After that, he had completed that <laughs> prayer. He took then the prophets of Baal the Grove, some 400 of them, and, and slew them. And uh, after he had done that, the Bible says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested of himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Uh, I, I want to stop right there and, and say this to every one of you that are here this morning. We just spent this week uh, with an emphasis on being thankful for uh, whatever that God has blessed us with, and hopefully everyone uh, was thankful for uh, the things they have. But I also recognize that there are times whenever people... Uh, get to the point to where they think that they're the only one that's left and they put themselves on a pity trip. And there is no one that's worse than this than a supposedly Christian who likes to put themselves on a pity trip and feel sorry for themselves and, and, and is, woe is me. Well, let me tell you something this morning that if, if, if every single one of them would just open up their eyes a little bit and look around where they are, it wouldn't take them very long to find out that they really have got a lot to be thankful for and that probably most of our pity trips are pretty puny in comparison to what we have been blessed with. So if, if you're one of those people who get down to feeling sorry for yourself and you think nobody cares, nobody understands, nobody loves you, and on and on and on. You need to just be reminded that, uh, that you probably are still a very blessed individual. Now, Elijah, after that Jezebel had sent word, Jezebel was a queen uh, with her husband, uh, who was King Ahab, and and. And, and she, was a, she was a terribly wicked woman. There was no question about that. She was a woman that, that Elijah feared. And you would have thought after that he had been so close and to the Lord and God had answered his prayers and he'd seen all the powerful things that took place that he would have been very strong. Instead, According to the word of the Lord, whenever that Jezebel sent a threat to him and said, you know, by the time, this time tomorrow evening, you'll be like those prophets that you've slain, Elijah took off and he fled for his life. Now, here's the interesting thing. Elijah gets out here and he's gone on a day's journey and he's had some people with him and he goes on out by himself and he sits down under a juniper tree and he prays to the Lord. And you know what he asked the Lord? He asked the Lord that he can die. Just let me die, Lord. Well, why didn't he just stay there and let Jezebel kill him? <laughs> if he wanted to die, she was going to accommodate him. I sometimes say that about people. You know, if you really are that pitiful and you're that sorry, then probably you're such a sorry person that there isn't any reason for you to go on. Just go ahead and die. Now, that sounds a little hard and a little harsh, and I guess probably truthfully, I don't think that. But I get disgusted sometimes with people who are always on a pity trip and like that they're the only one in the world. 
And Elijah's going to feel this way. He says, Lord, he says, you know, just go ahead and take my life. And, 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 and he says, and let me be as my fathers were. And the Bible says, and he lay down and slept under a juniper tree. Behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. Now then, he, he lays down then after he's prayed that the Lord will just let him die and goes to sleep. There isn't anything that's any more useless than a Christian who's on a pity trip. They're no good to anyone. They're not good for themselves. They're not good for the Lord. They're not good for His cause. They're not good for the church. They're not good for the preacher. They're not good for anyone. Because all they want to do is just be sorry for themselves. And they're not thinking about anyone else excepting themselves. Now, I hope that there's not a single one of you who've ever been guilty of this, but I suspect that probably in some of our lives, there have been those times when we felt that way. And I want you to think about it this morning. Whenever that you were in that condition, you weren't very interested in anyone else and anyone else's problems or concerns or cares excepting you. And that's the position Elijah he lays down and he goes to sleep. An angel wakes him up, says, get up, get up. Do you know how many times in the word of the Lord that God says to his children, get up? You're not going to do much sitting around. You're not going to do much laying around. You've got to get up and to go. When you look at the commission that was given unto the church, the first thing it says is, go. If you look into the word of the Lord, Jesus, whenever he was giving his instructions, he always said, come unto me. To a world that's lost, they need to come to the Lord. Once they have come to the Lord and the Lord has redeemed their souls and made them one of his children, he doesn't say come. He says, go. Go you that for. We need to be able to go. But too much of the time we're sitting, we're laying down, we're asleep. We're not concerned about anyone or anything excepting ourselves. Angel wakes him up and says, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. Now you see, God has a whole totally different perspective of an individual's life than many times we do. There are many times that I'm sure that as I think of my own life, I, I, and I found myself, I think I've shared with you all this a number of times that as I make that little run just after you pass the McCracken property, you head south on 83 Highway where you go across to Humansville there and you go south, there have been any number of times I've said, Lord, what in the world am I doing here? And I mean that in all sincerity. I've, I've said that. I've been guilty of that. I know why I'm here. I, I know why that I'm back in Missouri and I'm not still in California. I know that. But there are times whenever that it just hits me, what am I doing here? And sometimes I just feel like that I'm not doing anything. I'm, I'm wasting my life. I hope that's not the case. But you see how easy it is to get caught into that all of a sudden feeling like that you're worthless and you're, you're no value to anyone and you can't do anything. Listen, I know that whenever the Lord helps me, I can preach the word as good as any man there is. I can't preach any better than they can, but I can preach as good as they can because of the Spirit of God. As well, preacher, you, you're getting a little egotistical. No, I'm not. I'm just telling you that God can do just as much through me and as much through you as he can anyone else. But we sometimes have got to be confident in the Lord that he's going to be able to do that. And we've got to understand that he sees our lives much better than we do. And God already knew that he wasn't through with Elijah yet. Elijah's thinking, I'm, I'm through. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I just want to die. Get it over with. Lord says, you know, get up. I've, I've provided for you. Remember, they'd been in the drought here for three and a half years. Water was scarce, but there was water provided to him. There was food provided to him. 
But he lay back down and went to sleep again. The angel woke him up again. He said, you've got to eat. You've got to get ready. You're going to be going somewhere. And he arose and did eat and drank and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights and to Horeb the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged uh, there and behold the word of the Lord came to him and he said unto him, What dost thou hear, Elijah? What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Do you ever think about that? Do you ever think about why God has placed you here? See, I, I love to stand up here and preach and to preach to you people. I love you. And I mean that in all sincerity. I love this church and I love it because I read in the word of the Lord where the Bible says God has placed the members in the body as it has pleased him. So I know every one of you are here because God has placed you here. Not because I, I, I'm the pastor here. Not because that somebody else invited you. But God placed you here. I, I, I believe that with everything there is about me. And, and certainly it takes us inviting. It takes us to be hospitable. It takes us being able to say, hey, you know, we love one another. We want you to be here. But the bottom line is God is dealing in the lives of people. And he places them in the body as it has pleased him. How thankful I am he doesn't ask me. Some of you might not have made it. No, I'm only kidding. I already told you I love you. And I mean that in all sincerity. But listen, sometimes we need to look and we need to ask ourselves, what Lord, what am I doing here? What, what, are you ha what am I to do? What do you want me to do? Instead of saying, oh, I'm, I'm, just a, I'm just a poor little person that can't do anything. That used to be a favorite thing that people get up in testimony meetings. And, and, and I know why they were doing it. They were doing it because they wouldn't just say, oh, God bless your little heart. You know, I, I want to kind of stroke you a little bit. I want to make you feel better. They can say, oh, you know, I'm just a poor little old unworthy Christian. Well, we're all unworthy. But they weren't saying it because they were humble. They were saying it to be stroked a little bit. Somebody to brag on them a little bit. Listen, I want you to know this morning that every single one of you as a child of God have the privilege of having the presence and the power of the Lord in your lives and you can do things for Him. You don't have to go around feeling sorry for yourself. Just say, Lord, Take me and use me. But the, 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 the word came to Elijah and said, What are you doing here? What dost thou hear? Now listen. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Now, what he was saying was true up to a point here. He had, that the children of Israel had forsaken the Lord. He had challenged them. He had stood true to the Lord. He said, and they had thrown down the altars and everything. But he said, I only am left. Some of our churches are still preaching today. We're the only one left. We're the only one that's out here standing true to the Lord. Well, let me tell you something. It would be a sad day if that were true. That would mean we weren't one of them because we weren't it. God still has people. God still has churches. God still has preachers. God still has People working throughout this great world of ours, proclaiming his gospel, and he is still saving people throughout the world, not just in Hickory County and not just in Elton Baptist Church, not, nor in that little church that thinks they're the only one that's left. Now listen. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. This is what the, uh, the angel of the Lord says. You go out there and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. 
And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And afterward the wind and earth and after the wind and earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. Man, I want you to know sometimes God has to do some powerful things to get people's attention. But don't you doubt for a second that he doesn't have the ability and the capability to do that. He can get our attention and he knows exactly how to do it. We many times think, oh, you know, uh, unless the Lord just comes along and knocks me down. A lot of people like to talk about how the Lord knocked old Saul down whenever he was on the road to Damascus. You go back and read it again. It does not say one single time that the Lord knocked him down. It does not say it, folks. The Bible says he fell down. He fell down because of fear in his heart. There's a big difference in whether Ronnie Carlyle comes in here and knocks me down here on the floor and whether I, because of great fear, fall here in the floor. He comes over and knocks me down, and as much as I love him, it'll make me mad or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't care who it be. I use Ronnie because I know I can get away with it. But <laughs> it might be Carolyn who'd do it, you know. <laughs> but I'd still be mad, Carolyn. <laughs> but if I fall under the great power of the Lord, I'll have a totally different attitude. Yeah. Old Saul of Tarsus, whenever he fell to the earth, he cried out and said, The Lord, who art thou? He wasn't say, I'll knock the fire out of you as soon as I get up from here. Listen, God is powerful today. He can still do powerful things, but he doesn't always do everything in great power. The angel said, you go out here and stand before the Lord. And the Lord passed by in wind, but he was not in the wind. Earthquake, he was not in the earthquake. Fire, and he was not in the fire. But then the Bible says there was a still, small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What dost thou hear, Elijah? What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Listen. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Go back up and read. He just exactly what he said before. He's still, he's still here. Now listen. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Herod to be Hazel to be king over Syria, and Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Emeholah shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elias slay. Now here's what, here's what, here's what effectively, as he listens to that still small voice he's hearing, you get up and you go. Because I've still got some work for you to do. There's still some things that you ought to do you're, you're still telling me the same story. You're still telling me, oh, I went down here and I was faithful unto the Lord. I've taken care of slaying those false prophets, but I'm, I'm the only one left. Now listen, the Lord threw that still small voice, not in the earthquake, not in the fire, not in the wind, 
But in the still small voice that was speaking to him, said, listen, here's what I want you to do. And he told him exactly what it was that he was to do. Do you know the Lord does not leave people in darkness? The Lord does not let people know exactly. I rem I'm reminded of whenever that, the, the, as I went, go back again to Saul when he was on the road. As God was dealing with him, he had one of his servants down the city. He said, I want you to get up and I want you to go. And here's where I want you to go. I'm going to give you the, I'm going to give you the residence that I want you to go to. I'm going to tell you exactly where that I want you to go. I want to tell you who it is that you're going to find when you get there. And I want to tell you what it is that you're going to say. God doesn't leave us just perchance to just get out here and do whatever we want. God's pretty explicit. Our Sunday school class for the last three months, I guess it's a quarter, uh, has been studying out of the Old Testament of the all the, 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 the laws and the Levitical priesthood and the exodus and everything. And it, and it is so boring and so repetitive at times because it's just over and over and over the same thing. But you know what? It had to be that way to get it into people's heads. Because the Lord says, I want things done my way. He has not changed, folks. He still wants things done His way. And, but He tells us how He wants them done, where He wants them done, when He wants them done, to whom they're to be done, and we need to follow Him. Do it the way the Lord says, not the way we think, not the way we kind of like to do it, but the way He says. Elijah, you get up and you go. And here are the things that I want you to do. And then when you've done that, listen. He said, and it shall come to pass him that escapes. And he goes ahead. Now listen. So I've got some work to do. Now I want to just tell you one more thing, Elijah. And I want you to hear this good. Yeah. I have left me 7,000 in Israel all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. Elijah, I want you to just know one more thing. You're feeling like you're the only one left. You're the only one that's doing anything for me, but I want you to understand, I've got 7,000 people down there in Israel that have never failed me. They have never bowed to Baal. They have never kissed him. They have remained true and faithful. You think you're the only one left. You're the only one that's doing anything for me. You never even looked around to see what I'm able to see. Let me tell you something in closing this morning. I cannot see as God sees. I cannot do as God does. But I can assure you this morning that God can look into the hearts of each and every single one of us that are here today. He knows where we are in His sight. And He knows whether or not we are in a position in our lives to be able to listen to Him and follow His instructions or whether we're still just kind of whining and crying around about how pitiful everything is. I hope that we'll get our act together and that we'll be able to say, Lord, here am I. Send me. I'm listening, and I believe in that still, small voice that will guide me and direct me as it has so faithfully all the time that I've been one of your children.